is NUR 201. I want to go through the information about the concept of infection. For pediatrics portion of NUR 201, our main sources of infection that we're going to discuss are going to be eyes with conjunctivitis and ears for otitis media. We're going to start with ears, but I want to just talk through just a moment here. The PowerPoint goes through just one slide with the differences in A and P. The vision is not essential for what we're talking about conjunctivitis, but just to remind you that the vision in infants is not fully developed and so they do not have central vision at birth. That doesn't impact conjunctivitis, just general what is different in peds than it is in adults. The other is important for otitis media, and this is eustachian tube being shorter, wider, and more horizontal in children. Therefore, it doesn't drain as well and allows for the integration of or the uh, increased susceptibility for kids to have ear infections or otitis media. I want to keep stay away from using the word infection and we'll talk about why in just a moment. So with otitis media, it is inflammation. Anytime you have an itis, it's an inflammation, this time of the middle ear. It is related to eustachian tube dysfunction as we just saw on the slide prior. And here's a key point. Sometimes accompanied by infection, otitis media does not mean ear infection. We commonly use them interchangeably, not always the case. Otitis media, there's going to be, we're going to talk acute versus chronic, just like we have with other disorders. We know that it's very common in children, very high prevalence of a child having uh, an ear infection at some point in their life. Here's some interesting tidbits as far as who's more susceptible, more frequent in boys, those that are in daycare, not because otitis media is, is contagious, but the upper respiratory infection that often precedes it is. Allergies, again, because of the increased rhinitis and increased fluid. Exposure to tobacco smoke, secondhand smoke is a, is a known risk factor for otitis media, and long-term pacifier use. This goes back to the sucking reflex or sucking motion and the kind of the reflux of the saliva that's going to then stay in the throat uh, posterior area and have more of a conduction to the of that fluid up the eustachian tube and into the middle ear. I would also add one more thing to this slide is bottle propping, putting kids to bed with a bottle uh, is going to, again, increase that sucking that then is going to reflux fluid into their middle ears. Mm, so on this slide, what you see is a picture, um, and it has both pictures are acute otitis media. It looks red. It looks like there's pressure. It looks like it hurts because it does. So this is both, these are both examples of acute otitis media. We're going to contrast that in the next few slides with chronic otitis media with effusion, or OME. You're going to most often see this, and in your reading, listed as chronic otitis media. And what this is, is in relation to fluid. All right, so looking at acute, just like you saw in the picture, think red, think throbbing, think acute onset of pain. There is redness on that tympanic membrane. There is still fluid there, which is causing the pressure, but it's caused by often bacteria. So think of the acute as the bacterial infection that may occur. It can be caused by viral, and we'll talk about this more later in the presentation as well. Then otitis media with effusion, think chronic, okay? So the chronic piece here is that there's fluid in the middle ear, often chronic, more commonly associated with hearing loss. Think about it, these kids are hearing like they're underwater. Can you hear well when you're swimming and underneath the water? No, these kids can't hear through the water that's in their ear. The manifestations here are all related to acute because with your chronic, all it is is hearing loss and the kids don't know what they can't hear. But with acute, they sure know that it hurts, right? So you're gonna have kids pulling at their ear. Diarrhea because of the stress, one of the things that kids tend to do is nausea, vomiting, diarrhea with pretty much anything, ear infections included. Fever, potentially up to 102, 103. Irritability and acting out, they can't always verbalize, especially think about those one and two year olds. They can't say why they feel bad, so they're just fussy. And the night awakenings with crying, this is hallmarked by having ER visits at 10 or 11 o'clock at night. 
You put the kid down to sleep at 7. They might have even fallen asleep, but they wake up screaming at 10 or 11. What's happened? They've laid down. It's increased the pressure. They're no longer distracted by play and other things during the day. So they really are feeling this intense pain that happens. So this is oftentimes when we'll see uh, manifestations. Again, all of these symptoms are with the acute otitis media. So what do we do? For the medical treatment, we're going to go ahead and give antibiotics. There is new evidence that a lot of ear infections may be viral. And so we're having doctors give the prescription for antibiotics, but say wait and see if this clean, clears itself up in a day or two, and then go ahead and start the antibiotics. Treat with pain, uh, with Tylenol and such, but if they are not improving in 24, 48 hours, go ahead and start the antibiotics. It is still a common reason for antibiotics and should be, um, because as we talked about, it is often infection with acute, but not always. Don't memorize this dose, but new, do know that amoxicillin is the first line. Um, when we're talking analgesics, this is talking about Tylenol. We're not giving them strong pain medicine. Tylenol is usually going to be what they need. It can be alternated with um, ibuprofen, which is also Motrin, Advil, right? Um, but typically Tylenol is going to be what you need. With the otitis media with effusion, these kids are the chronic kids, <coughs> chronic kids. This is uh, not treated with antibiotics because there's not infection involved. This is where there's fluid trapping. Look at the time frame. If they have this otitis media with effusion for greater than four months, then we're going to likely be talking myringotomy, tympanostomy tubes. So this is when they're getting those ear tubes. Prevention, most of what we're preventing is going to be with the acute. So we're going to do prevention with things like avoiding pacifiers for extended periods of time, avoiding bottle propping or putting the child to bed with a bottle causing that reflux, avoiding secondhand smoke, of, um, trying to make sure we're treating as early as possible that upper respiratory infection. Um, those are our main sources of prevention. Medication education, making sure the parents know this is use all of the medication prescribed, speaking of those antibiotics, making sure they know how to give Tylenol goes between medication education as well as pain relief. Hearing checks, especially those chronic kiddos, we have a significant um, improvement in hearing after those ear tubes go in because it lets the fluid out. We also see a rapid uptick in the child's ability to speak if they have uh, speech delays, it might be because they couldn't hear. Perioperative care is when we're talking about those um, BMT or those uh, ear tubes, right, your myringotomy or tympanostomy tubes. And so that would be a same-day surgery procedure. Uh, certainly parents have concerns, but it is a very common procedure. That growth and development is going back with that speech and other delays that they might have from not being able to uh, hear well. I'm not going to take the time to read this case study to you, but I want you to pause the echo at this moment, pause your video, read through that case study, and I'm going to go ahead now and continue on the next slide with some of those answers or discussion points to the case study. So we have Pete here. Oh, sorry, too far. So what else do we need to be asking mom about with Pete? We know his age. We know that he's certainly at risk for having an ear infection simply by his age, etc. What are other things that we need to know? We need to know his hydration status. We need to know how much fluid he's been having in because kids that don't feel well don't want to eat or drink. We also need to know what his history. What is his history of having um, ear infections? What is his history of recent illness? What are his signs and symptoms? So what do you think the problem is? Otitis media with his symptoms, fever, fussy, etc. Which kind is it? It's going to be your acute otitis media, not your chronic. Okay, chronic kids aren't going to have pain. They're going to go for a well child check, and the doc's going to see the fluid. That's how they know that's there. Let alone the, gro the growth and development delays for those guys. So what do we need to do intervention-wise? Fluid hydration, Tylenol for pain and fever, and get those antibiotics started. 
especially since this has been going on for a few days, this is not likely a viral that's working itself through. So this is likely going to be a kiddo that needs to get that amoxicillin, unless they're allergic, and making sure we ask that question as well to mom. And then follow up. Within um, two weeks, the child should be feeling better in about three days. Within two weeks, um, we need to get them back into the pediatricians to take a look at that ear and see that there's improvement. Educational needs for mom, medication, medication compliance, medication dosing, and making sure that this kiddo is getting their full course of medications. Comfort, keep them sitting up, maybe a warm compress, um, certainly the Tylenol, but making sure that they're keeping that kiddo comfortable. And we'll talk about a few others in just a moment with a question. Uh, and then looking at prevention. This is certainly a common occurrence but what else do we need to be looking at for these guys as far as prevention? All right, let's go ahead here and do an NCLEX question. So go ahead and read on your, on your screen or your slide. Child been diagnosed with otitis media, acute otitis media of the right ear. Which intervention should the nurse apply in the plan of care? Take a look through. The right answer here is going to be A, D, and E. A is a soft diet because thinking about when you're chewing something crunchy, it's loud, it's popping in your ear, their ears already hurt. So soft diet because chewing hurts. D, because Tylenol for the fever or pain. And then E for that full course of antibiotics. The position of the child does not impact the care or the pressure or the comfort. The only time positioning is important is if you're using eardrops as part of their treatment regimen and then positioning just during the time of medication. Uh, and then C, administer antihistamines. That does a drying up, but first of all, this is acute otitis media, not going to be much of an impact here. And it really is not recommended to use antihistamines in children much, and it's not been for about eight to nine years. And the reason is it prolongs the symptoms. It tends, they tend to have rebound um, congestion versus clearing up. All right, here's a question um, that I don't love, but I wanted to put in here for discussion points. The nurse is aware that the most common organism that causes otitis media is, what is the most common organism? Let's take a look. I come down to two almost right answers. So the first is adenovirus, that it may be viral. The other is Staphylococcus aureus, but truly the most common um, trigger, or the co most common bacteria, I should say, is going to be a Streptococcus pneumoniae. So Staph is a potential, but it's more likely to be um, Staph or a Strep, depending on which resource you look at. So bottom line is, viral or bacterial could be either. It could be Staph. It is not likely to be herpes simplex and is not likely to be a fungal, a Candida albicans. Um, but A and B, depending on which resource you look at, um, and B, m potentially strep uh, instead of staff. So I don't love the question, but I just wanted to have it in there as a discussion point for multiple etiologies for otitis media. It should also be listed here as acute because otitis media with effusion or chronic is not going to have one of these causes. It's simply going to be fluid. Okay, switching over to our other line of conversation, and this is about conjunctivitis, so switching over to eyes, obviously. This is, again, a comparison between bacterial and viral. So when you're looking at it, this comparison chart is that both are common in children, but bacterial is more common in children than it is in adults. But if there's conjunctivitis in adults, it's more likely to be viral, and it could either be because of allergens or simply a virus, right? Um, but with children, we, seen, we tend to see that they are much more common to have it in, um, in, ch in childhood. Sorry, that was redundant. Um, but both from neonates from delivery, but also older children and simply hand-eye contact. It is contagious, so we do see this spread between daycares and at school settings. When you think of the bacterial conjunctivitis, think pink eye. Periorally drainage, so they're going to have that pus, right? And it is usually one eye. Pink eye can spread to the other, especially when we're talking hand-eye contact, but it is often unilateral. When we're talking viral, they're going to have serous drainage, which is clear, similar symptoms, just like you're having an allergic runny eye, 
and it is usually bilateral. So look at the differences between the two. When we're talking viral, this is something that is often um, going to be adenovirus. With bacterial, it can be staph, it can be, influ uh, it can be strep, there's a variety of things that it could be. Um, so when you're talking viral, adenovirus, when you're talking bacterial, strep, staph, but any of the bacteria can cause conjunctivitis. So what are we going to do? First you need to know the cause, right? So knowing that hand washing is uh, an important piece of, of the prevention of spread. But before that, what's the cause? So if it's viral, there's not a whole, whole lot you can do about it. Um, but bacterial, what are we going to do? What's our treatment? Our treatment is going to be antibiotic drops or ointment and making sure that parents know how to do that. So if you're unfamiliar with giving medication via eye drop or via eye ointment, you want to take a look at that. Comfort care, how do we then keep that child comfortable? If it is uh, either one, most of the crusting is going to happen with the bacterial or the pink eye version, but warm compresses to uh, relieve that uh, discomfort, keeping their head elevated uh, is going to be most of what we need to do. We want to prevent them from rubbing their eye because that could lead to a corneal abrasion and that's going to be even more painful. Prevention um, of the spread, especially in a daycare or a school setting, you want to make sure that the, the provider is notified that they could do of this so that they can do a more thorough cleaning. Usually a 10% bleach solution is what they're going to need to do. And key, just like always, basic care and comfort, hand washing, hand washing, hand washing. All right, so uh, nurses preparing to perform prophylaxis uh, for ophthalmia neonatorum, for the neonate. What are the steps that you're going to do? Um, because I, I, this brings us back to the neonate. This, this is a procedure that we're going to do. Every neonate is going to have prophylaxis for conjunctivitis just simply from exposure during delivery, right? So what do we need to do in what order? So take a minute, look through your steps. And so what do we need to do in order here? So we're going to start with A, washing hands and putting on gloves. Then C, tilt the head to the side receiving treatment. F, raise the upper lid, pull the uh, lower eyelid down. E, instill the ointment in the lower conjunctival sac. So we're not trying to go straight across. We're trying to, to make that pocket underneath the eye and put it there. Close and manipulate the eyelid to spread the drug. Really close the eye and squish it around. And D, repeat the procedure for the other side. So this would be prophylactic treatment for those neonates. Bacterial conjunctivitis has affected several children at a local daycare center. A nurse should advise which measure to minimize the risk of infection. Close the daycare center for one week to control the outbreak. Restrict the infected children from returning for 48 hours after treatment. Perform thorough hand washing before and after touching any child in the daycare setting, center. Um, and, or D, set up a conference with the parents of each child to explain the situation carefully. The right answer here is going to be C, perform thorough hand washing before and, before and after touching any child in the daycare center. We don't need to close for a week. It's certainly not that significant of an outbreak. Restrict the infected child from returning for 48 hours after treatment. This is longer than necessary, and, and so the, the key time frame here is 24 hours. So if the child's been on antibiotic drops or ointment for 24 hours, they're okay to return. Uh, hand washing, we said, was the correct answer, and then we don't need to do the detail of setting up a conference with each parent um, for simple conjunctivitis. This ends the slides and it ends the um, information session for conjunctivitis and otitis media. Please come with any questions.